Hi, I'm Dr. Charles Cobbs. I am a neurosurgeon in Seattle and I'm the director of a brain tumor research institute as well. And I wanted to present a, a very interesting case of a patient today for students and patients and family members that is uh, quite interesting because it's in the intersection of molecular biology, cancer biology, genetics, and neurosurgery. So the patient I want to present today has a disorder called Lermit Duclos, and the primary problem the patient has is a mass in the cerebellum. What is the cerebellum? The cerebellum, if you look at the model of the skull or the brain, here's the head, and the cerebellum is in the back part of the brain, and it's shown in this model as this green structure here at the base of the brain. The cerebellum is the part of the brain that controls fine motor movements. So if your right cerebellum is not working well, if you reach out to touch something, you may have a jerky movement like that. Um, and it allows you to do smooth motor movements, okay? So why does this patient have something wrong with his cerebellum? Well, it turns out that he was born with a genetic disorder called Cowden syndrome. And Cowden syndrome is fascinating because this syndrome, C-O-W-D-E-N, Cowden syndrome is uh, a autosomal dominant genetic disorder of a tumor suppressor gene. So what does that mean? That means if you have two copies of every chromosome in your body, I mean every, yeah, every chromosome has two copies of the same gene. So let's say the normal gene is here for what we're talking about and there's a mutated one here. If you have children and one of your children gets that one, then that kid will have that disorder. If you, if that child gets this copy when your gene, when you uh, mate, then you, that kid will not have that disorder. So in general, 50% of the people, the offspring of someone with a autosomal dominant gene will inherit that gene and pass it on forever and ever to their offspring. So what is the mutated gene in Cowden syndrome? Well, the gene that's mutated is a gene that is involved with <clears throat> tumor inhibition or it's a tumor suppressor gene and it's called PTEN. So what is PTEN or P10? Well, in general, if you look at a, a cell in your body, it has mem the membrane of the cell and then the cell has receptors on the surface of the cell. And if something binds to that receptor, it can trigger a signaling activity. So let's say something binds like a growth factor, that will tell that cell to grow. And the way it knows to grow is <clears throat> there's activation of the inside of that protein. And that activation puts phosphate groups on that protein. And that protein can go down and activate other proteins. Now, one of the critical things that happens in this signaling pathway is there's a protein that blocks that pathway called PT, P10 is the abbreviation. So if this pathway is activated, it will activate a gene called AKT, and then that will go further down and tell DNA in the nucleus to divide and grow. So if this gene here is the one that's mutated, let's say you're born with this Cowden syndrome mutation of the P10 gene, then your cells will have a decreased ability to put the brakes on activation of signaling. And the, and the net result will be that there will be a abnormal quote unquote grow signal or the accelerator will be more active without brakes being applied. So what happens in Cowden syndrome is people can get all kind of abnormalities <clears throat> that are called hamartomas and they can have an increased risk of cancer. So what's a hamartoma? 
A hamartoma is like an abnormal growth that's not cancer. Um, sometimes your skin will grow into these little blobs of skin. Uh, and in the case of this patient, the uh, cerebellum can have a uh, very, very rare type of growth. It's not really cancer, not really a tumor, but it's called a gangliocytoma, which is a very long word. But the bottom line is that if you look at the cerebellum of a patient with Lermit Duplo, which is the syndrome, and I'll spell that, it's called L-H-E-R-M-I-T-T-E Duclo, D-U-C-L-O-S, Lermit Duclo syndrome, they can have this abnormal growth of part of the cerebellum. So in this patient, the right side of his cerebellum, a big quadrant of it, has this abnormal growth. And over time, that growth expanded the pressure. And what's also important to know is when you look at the inside of the brain, there are places in the inside called the ventricles, and that's where spinal fluid is produced. And spinal fluid can only get out of the brain if it comes down through these ventricles, down into this area, down through here, down through this called the fourth ventricle, and then escapes down here. So this patient, his cerebellum was so grown and so tight that it blocked the ability of spinal fluid to come out of his out of his head basically and so it starts dilating and backing up like a balloon under pressure so because this person has this autosomal dominant genetic mutation carried on from his parents into his into him that causes inhibition of a tumor suppressor protein called p10 that means he's got abnormal growth throughout his body and multiple organs. And we looked at CAT scans and he's got hamartomas all over the place in his internal organs. He's got this Lermit Duclo mass that's called a gangliocytoma that's kind of like a tumor, but not really a tumor. He's also got some of the other findings possibly that are associated with Cowden syndrome called macrocephaly, where the head is abnormally big. Um, it's also associated in about 20% of people with um, learning disability or mental disability. So this patient has been kind enough to let me interview him uh, and to discuss his case and show him during surgery to discuss the way we treat him. In a nutshell, from a neurosurgical perspective, as I mentioned, the first thing that we were dealing with was this backed up pressure in the brain called hydrocephalus, which is causing him to have nausea, vomiting, vision trouble. Uh, and so we fixed that in a t first by placing a tube down into the ventricle, draining the spinal fluid through a little valve that goes down to the belly. So we uh, relieve the pressure. And once that situation was all under control, we brought him back to take care of the primary problem, which was this gigantic mass in his uh, right cerebellum. And then we removed that cerebellar mass. Uh, by the way, we did do genetic testing on him for Cowden syndrome, and we did verify that he has a mutation in the P10 uh, protein or the P10 gene. Um, and we have uh, alerted him and his family members about this. Um, and so I think it's a fascinating case to see uh, how one small DNA mutation can lead to a broad variety of abnormalities uh, necessitating surgery, family counseling, uh, and watching out for other cancers that might pop up in the future. Hey, I'm Dr. Cobbs, and I wanted to thank you so much for allowing me to interview you. Um, you've got a quite interesting story, and um, I think you might have a very rare neurological disorder that's often related to genetic disorder. Um, but we're going to be talking about this mass in your cerebellum, which is in the back of your brain, the very bottom part of your brain. And um, why don't you just tell me, you said starting in February you started having symptoms, and now it's November, so it's been, what, nine months or so? Yep. 
So basically in, in, I didn't realize it was in February, but you know, I've got enough history to, when I first started getting headaches was in February. I started, I went to urgent care actually, and I've had problems ever since then. And it wasn't until, and I've actually had episodes of vomiting attacks and stuff like that. So headaches, vomiting, your speech sounds a little slurred to me too, and that's something you think might be going on, huh? I don't notice a slurred speech, but I've had more than one person comment about slurred speech. And you said you've had blurred vision? Yeah, and that's the one thing I've noticed recently. I thought, like, you know, my I do wear glasses, so I just didn't even pay attention, but I, I did make a comment that I felt like my vision was getting a little bit worse than normal. So headaches, blurred vision, nausea, vomiting. How about your balance when you're walking? And when I'm walking, I've all, it's not been serious, but it's been, uh, I feel like I'm off balance a little bit all the time. So the cerebellum controls fine motor movements. And one test we have is the finger nose finger test that you've done a couple of times. Can you do that for me? Touch my finger and now your nose and go back and forth. Yep. I'm gonna do it again. So your hand's a little wobbly when you try to do that. Now try with the left hand. A little difficult, huh? Yeah. Try to do that thing where you flap your hands up and over like that. Both hands at the same time, as fast as you can. A little difficult, a little slow. So you have a mass that's growing in your cerebellum. And you said about eight years ago, somebody in Texas did an MRI and they said there was something slow growing in your cerebellum, but they didn't think there was anything that needed to be done surgically, right? So uh, the neurosurgeon and the radiologist, like I was having some problems that ended up being traced back to a thyroid issue. But I did, they did notice there was a little mass, uh, it was small at that time, so I don't know if it's going A little big. mass in the cerebellum. And they measured for the next couple of years and it wasn't growing. So you have something that has characteristics on MRI of a really, really rare thing called Lermit Duclos, L-H-E-R-M-I-T-T-E, -T -T -E, new name, D-U-C-L-O-S. And that's a thing associated with a disease called Cowden syndrome, where one of the genes that decreases cell growth is not working, it's mutated, and so things can grow abnormally. And uh, people can get skin growths and uh, other little tumors. Now, and I've actually had a tumor that was removed as a child. From where? Right here, I actually still have the scar. On your skin? Yeah, you can see the scar. I didn't even know that. Yeah, it's actually a scar. It was right. a skin tumor. It was a skin tumor. Okay, and I we did a CAT scan of your abdomen, and there's some things called hemangiomas that are all over the place. They and I've had related. yeah, and I've had fat cysts all over the place and stuff like that. If I look at your brain MRI, it's striking in that first of all we see you have hydrocephalus, which is dilation of the ventricles in the brain. And I mentioned to you the spinal fluid is constantly being made in the brain at the top part, yeah. and it has to go through the ventricles and come out at the bottom of the brain. Yeah. But the bottom of your brain is jam-packed because of this huge mass on the right side of your brain in the cerebellum. And it has these, I think they call them tiger stripes, characteristic of this Lermit Duclos thing, which is not really thought to be a tumor per se, but maybe sort of somewhere in between uh, hamartoma, which is abnormal growth and, and low grade tumor. But it gets bigger and bigger over time. And when it compresses this pathway for spinal fluid, it basically is like a cork in the bottom of your brain. And the spinal fluid pressure builds up. That causes balance trouble. The balance trouble also is caused by direct issues with the cerebellum not working right because it's getting squashed. Um, the headaches, nausea, vomiting are from the increased pressure due to the backed up spinal fluid. The bulging, uh, the, your eye vision is related to the fact that the spinal fluid is connected to the nerve around your eyeballs. Yeah. And I can actually see that nerve here and there's spinal fluid wrapped around it suggesting it's being backed up and there's a lot of pressure and I can even see that at the back of your eyeball, it's pushing like it's convex here, concave, where it's pushing at the back of your eyeballs. And that is called papilledema and that can cause uh, blurred vision because your retina is right 
here and the pressure is building up here. When we look at the contrast scan, it doesn't really light up with contrast. Um, oops, wrong thing. Where'd it go? So when we look at contrast, it doesn't really light up with contrast, which is good. So um, the bottom line is our plan is to get the imaging studies from eight years ago in Texas, yep. compare them to now to see what the rate of growth is. In terms of your headache, nausea, vomiting, I think it will be alleviated by placing that shunt in that we described. So I'm gonna put a little tube in to drain the spinal fluid down to your belly. And then we're gonna discuss the options with surgery for your mass and your cerebellum. Okay. Whether we wanna take it out or just keep an eye on it, it's not malignant, but it sure is causing a lot of trouble. So we may end up having to take it out. Yeah, okay. Any, uh, any questions about anything? No, I mean, like I said, eight years ago, I talked to the neurosurgeon. It was small enough. He said it probably caused you more problems to take it out. Okay. And uh, I probably was correct at that time, but yeah. now it's causing a lot of trouble. Yeah, I had it started, as I said, started a lot in February. It slowly progressed. It was really, that's the only reason I came to see uh, Friday. Uh, I went, I was having problems. I had a got really bad when I went out, was flying back from Minneapolis and uh, they wanted to take me to the doctor but they couldn't tell me all they could say was my blood pressure and that was it so I came back but I did make an appointment well I'm glad we got you in here now yeah all right thanks again for letting us talk to you okay thank no problem well Alan you're back to see me for your post-operative visit after the shunt here's where the shunt went in and we put it in a, a valve here that can be adjusted with a magnet before you had the shunt placed, you had a really backed up high pressure situation with your spinal fluid in your brain called hydrocephalus. And it was giving you blurred vision, headaches, I think some nausea maybe. Oh and yeah, I had nausea. They gave me nausea medication for a while now. And balance trouble. And some balance trouble. Since we put the shunt in, has that gotten better? The headaches have all gone away. Uh, the balance has gotten a lot better. Uh, the vision is still changing a little bit, but it has gotten better overall. Good. Uh, the v nausea has completely gone away. Great. About the only thing for pain, and it's gotten better, was where, you know, you put the tube. Yeah, I put tubing in your belly, right? Right. And you can just see. Yeah. Right there. So that's healed up pretty good. Yeah, that's healed up pretty much. Um, touch my finger with your right index finger. So you're still a little wobbly when you do that, but it's better. Yeah, it's definitely better. So now we're talking about going and fixing the actual cause of the problem, which is this Lermit Duclos type of mass that's kind of like a tumor, slow growing, most likely benign, um, and it's causing pressure in the bottom of your brain and smashing onto your brain stem. Mm -hmm. And if I go over here to show your MRI, that's the right side of your brain is over here. And this is your norm, your cerebellum is normal on the left side. And this is your brain stem. And you can see that this is supposed to go all the way over like that. And then this weird looking stuff, and the radiologists call it tiger stripes, which is characteristic of Lermit Duclos. This is growing, growing, growing in over 20 years or so. As you know, it's gotten so big now that it's pinching your brain stem and blocking the spinal fluid pathway. Yep. So we're going to come in over here, remove this black stuff, which is bone, and then remove a bunch of that stuff, which is the abnormal um, tissue, and hopefully that will help you out. Yep. And we talked about there's some risks of infection or bleeding and maybe even making your cerebellum function worse, but hopefully that will not occur. Yeah. So we'll get that set up. Okay, thank you so much for uh, participating in this. All right. Well, it's been about two or three months since we did the first surgery on you, which was to place a shunt in. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna show a picture really quick of the CAT scan. So this is the surgery we did. That little white thing is the shunt catheter. Okay. And it drains this spinal fluid, which has got backed up pressure. The reason it's backed up is the bottom of your brain is being pinched from that tumor down there that's expanded and it's blocking the flow of spinal fluid out of the brain. So the first thing we had to do is take care of that pressure problem. So we placed a shunt in there 
it goes up and comes out and goes to that little valve right there that we can adjust. And it's the thing that's right here on your head, that little bump right there. Yep. And uh, that is working great because you haven't had headaches since we did that, right? Nope, no headaches with talk. But you still have trouble with your cerebellum. Mm -hmm. And I want you to try to touch my finger with your right hand. Now touch your nose. Okay, and now with both hands, I want you to try to go like this as fast as you can. Okay, it's a little slower on the right. Yeah. Now with your shin and heel, try to slide your heel down your shin. That's not too bad. So you still have some cerebellar issues. Yeah. And because of the Lermite de Clos, we're gonna try to remove that abnormal brain tissue that's compressing your, your normal cerebellum. And I'm gonna show you, over here, we're gonna switch this out and show the MRI. So the MRI is shown here. This is called a T2 signal MRI. It shows all that backed up spinal fluid. This is before we did the shunt. And then we see this area here down in the cerebellum where this tumor type tissue has expanded, compressing your brain stem, shoving the midline structures from here over to here, and generally causing problems with your cerebellum. Look how squashed your brain stem is right there. So we wanna go in there and get that out. So the surgery will involve making an incision behind the right ear, which is over here, removing this black stuff, which is the bone. And then we'll use a guidance system to identify the location of this stuff and try to get as much of it out as we can, being careful to stop before we get to the brainstem, which is a critical structure. And uh, hopefully when we do that, you will not have any worse cerebellar function, but it's possible. Okay. Hopefully you'll get better. And then we'll have that pressure taken off of your brainstem and your cerebellum. Okay. We talked about the risks of the surgery in the past, but there are risks of about one or 2% of an infection, serious bleeding trouble, something like that. Okay. Or even a stroke, but we're gonna take good care of you and we're gonna try to make you better, okay? Okay. All right, we'll see you in the operating room next week. Okay. Okay, we are now in the operating room. We're getting all set up to operate on this gentleman that has Lermite Duclos, big mass pushing on the cerebellum. We have registered him with the stealth station. It uses radio frequency and a locating device to know where the head is in three dimensions based on the MRI findings. So if I place this, if you can show screen there. When I move this around on his scalp, we see where we are on his head. So I've marked out these big veins here in the back of the head. It's called the transverse and sigmoid sinuses. The cerebellum is down in this area. I made a scratch on his skin where I want to make the incision. If you look at the uh, MRI, this abnormal tissue up here is where we're going to be heading. And so we'll use this during surgery to identify the location of this abnormal tissue, which I will remove to take the pressure off the brainstem. This is a radiolucent head holder made out of carbon fiber, so it doesn't interfere with the, the, there's no metal to interfere with the radio frequency. We've got a surgical microscope here that we'll use to uh, visualize the tumor when we're resecting it. We got our craft anesthesia team over here that uh, will keep our patient nice and quiet during the surgery. And over here we have a superstar scrub tech with all the t all the equipment we need for surgery. Gowns, these are patties. They're little cotton things we use during surgery to go around the tissue. And we'll set all this up in a minute and then make the incision here. All right, thank you. Okay, so we have our patient in position. We've made the incision on the skin. I've removed a little bit of the bone here, which is right here. And the dura is this substance here, which is like a little leathery membrane. And that's the cerebellum. What we're gonna do is open the dura under the microscope. And then we're gonna go up in that direction. And if you look over there, you can see 
where my pointer is on the screen. And I'm gonna go take that abnormal tissue out. And uh, hey, Alan, it's uh, now, what time is it? It's about a little afternoon. We did your yeah. surgery this morning. Yep. You're in the ICU, you went to the recovery room. Yep. How are you feeling after a big brain surgery? A uh, little bit of pain. Not much, actually, but a little bit of pain in the right-hand side of the Maya. Okay, remember we took that tissue out of your cerebellum, that abnormal uh, cerebellar gangliocytoma. That's what the official term is. I want to show you the CAT scan, okay? We yes. just got a CAT scan on you. And if you look here, this is the CAT scan. See all that is just fluid and air right there? Yep, I see a big difference. That's where I took all that bad stuff out and you can see it's all gone right all that stuff yep i can see that. all of that and so what's going to happen is your cerebellum is still pushed over that way but now that that's out all this stuff is going to move back to the middle and it's going to take the pressure off your I see some movement. um now you said after we did the shunt your vision got better so the pressure had decreased but yep. uh, now it's going to really pressure is going to be decreased in the very back of your head. Yep. Let's see how your cerebellum is doing. Can you touch my finger? Touch your nose? Go back and forth? Not too bad. It's about the same as it was before surgery. Um, <clears throat> how about your vision? Look at my finger over here. Look over here. Look up. Look down. Can you stick out your tongue? Okay. Uh, can you t roll to the r left a little so I can see the incision on the back of your head? Okay, that's nice and dry. Good. So, uh, for somebody who's about two hours out from surgery, I think you're doing pretty well. Yep, no. I uh, notice uh, it's about the same right now, but like I said, it took me about two days before I noticed the difference with the yeah. <laughs> shunt. We're going to get you up and about tomorrow walking around. Okay. And then hopefully get you home in a couple of days, okay? Okay. So you're not in much pain now? We can get you some pain <coughs> medicine if you are. I'm in a little bit of pain. A little bit of pain, okay. Yeah, That we had to go through some muscles back there, so that'll hurt for a day or so, then get a lot better, okay? Okay. All right, thanks for letting me interview you. No problem. All right. Okay, it's now uh, about 24 hours since your surgery, and we removed all that pressure off of the cerebellum. We took all that abnormal tissue out. And I think you're doing better. Can you do your finger to my finger again? I think that's definitely better than before. Yep, it's definitely gotten better. I think your cerebellum better. is working better. Yeah, it's uh, actually probably gotten better today. Wonderful. Yesterday it was about the same, but today it's gotten a little bit better. Well, it's only been a day, so we'll get you up and about. Let me take a look at your back of your head. It still looks good. So we'll get you walking around today and maybe go home tomorrow if you're doing great, okay? Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. So you can see that our patient has done well. He's had two surgeries for Lermit Duclos. The first surgery was to deal with the hydrocephalus, which was the dilated uh, spinal fluid space in the brain being caused by the effect of the tumor in his cerebellum compressing the ability of spinal fluid to exit the skull or exit the head and causing backing up and high pressure. So the first surgery was a ventriculoperitoneal shunt. The second surgery was the surgery to resect the tumor. Um, and the final component of the whole process is reviewing his tumor pathology. And so the final video that I'll show is a video I took from um, a video conference we had for Tumor Board where the pathologist is reviewing the microscopic tissue from his surgery and going over the characteristic findings for cerebellar gangliocytoma. This patient has gone on to do quite well and um, we will have him follow up with our neuro-oncologist to make sure that any other issues related to his Lermit Duclos and his Cowden disease are taken care of. The pathogens also uh, classic for um, this dysplastic um, cerebellar gangliocytoma or the mid the cross disease. Um, so if you, 
you can see that this is surface here and uh, the overall architecture is preserved per se, but uh, um, the internal granular layer and the black layer kind of expanded by this dysplastic looking uh, ganglion cells. And uh, um, there's, you know, vacuolation in the you know, uh, granular layer and the underlying white matter, uh, which is very classic. Um, like textbook kind of uh, picture. And then let me show you high power those dysplastic uh, ganglion cells. It's quite impressive. Um, the initial uh, substance kind of, you know, dispersed um, and, uh, um, and the organization is also uh, disordered. So this is um, to me, it looked like typical um, dysplastic cerebral um, gangliocytoma. So it fits very well with your um, imaging finding and uh, um, the clinical um, features you just presented.